Welcome to the Individual Matters Learning About Learning podcast and video series. Today we're focused on boundaries, why they matter, and how to set them. We're a couple of months into the school year, and in our discussions with parents and teachers, we're hearing a lot of questions and concerns about limits in the classroom, how to support them, and why they may be breaking down. But there's never really a bad time to talk about boundaries, since they're fundamental to healthy relationships with a personal, professional, or teacher-student. I'm your host, Andrew Caton, and today I'm joined by my wife and co-host, Dr. Katrina Caton, clinical psychologist. Hello, everybody. All right, let's get started. You're going to share 10 fundamentals of boundary setting. All right, so number one, setting a boundary is about changing your own behavior, not the students. So when you have problem behaviors in the classroom and you need to set some firm limits, you want to be thinking about what do I need to do differently or what is my action in this situation as opposed to telling the student what to do or asking the child to do something different. You're really focused on setting the boundary with your own behavior. And that'll be a theme throughout, I think, the rest of these 10 fundamentals, right, is we're really looking at changing our own behavior rather than whoever else, whether it's a personal relationship or a student or whatever else. These are things that we're going to do differently ourselves in order to create a different outcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, number two, boundaries are set with consistent action, not words and warnings. Oftentimes, if you're using words to set your boundary, you've already crossed it. The limit has been crossed, and it's not really going to work to set that consistent boundary. And with words and warnings, if the boundary is not set or if it's overreached, that's when the the, uh, tension seems to grow, doesn't it, when you keep adding more and more warnings. Please do this. This is the last time. I'm really telling you to do this. I'm counting down. These sorts of things um, should kind of cue you that maybe we're off track. We need to go look back at changing an action within ourselves. Absolutely. So the words and warnings either blur the boundary or they set you up for a nice long power struggle. All right. Number three, a negative reaction to a boundary indicates the boundary was needed. So the bigger the reaction that you get after you've set a limit or a boundary, the bigger indication that that boundary was absolutely needed and you are on the right track. So if you've made a change in your own behavior or your own actions and you're trying this out in a classroom and you get pushback or a negative reaction from a student, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're off track or that your new approach isn't working. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's right. It means your approach is working. So have confidence and know that you're doing the right thing. Okay, what's number four? The boundary defines where the adult's responsibility ends and the student's begins. It creates that really clear line. Number five, boundaries keep us from rescuing a child and really puts the learning in the natural consequences. So it, lo- it allows those natural consequences to that behavior to do the teaching as opposed to setting us up to rescuing or um, even over punishing or those kinds of things. So the boundary between one person's responsibility and their, and their actions in this case, I guess I'm thinking about if a, if a teacher steps over that boundary and tries to bail a student out of a problem that rightfully belongs to that student or to solve a problem that is within that student's area to solve, that's where that boundary gets crossed and then the student actually isn't benefiting, right? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Absolutely, so we're robbing them of a learning opportunity and then we're making it about the power struggle again as opposed to the natural consequences. Okay, what's number six? Boundaries promote ownership by clearly defining who owns the problem. So when there's a clear and consistent boundary set, then it's very clear the child owns the problem and they're the ones who come up with the solution for fixing that problem. Okay, number seven, all relationships have boundaries regardless how intentional we are when we're setting them. So essentially, every relationship that you can think of has some boundary. Some are um, more meshed, some are more rigid, some are clear, some are unclear. Regardless, every relationship has some form of boundaries. And so since they're there, we really have to be intentional when we're setting them. If we're not intentional when we're setting them, then perhaps the child gets to determine where that boundary is set. So a hands-off approach, it sounds like it's still setting boundaries or boundaries are, boundaries are still forming as a result of thinking that maybe you're taking a hands-off approach or that if you're being really authoritative, boundaries are being set, but they might not be the healthy boundaries. Is that what you're saying? That's right. So 
the boundary is set and if you don't want it to pop up in the wrong place you got to be intentional with where you set it from the very beginning okay number eight boundaries teach others how to treat us and a lack of clear and healthy boundaries will invite in a lack of respect so where we set that limit and how we set that boundary teaches others how to treat us number nine Boundaries create a safe space for children to learn, to create, and grow with confidence. So we know children are more creative, they're more confident, they feel safe, and they're more able to learn in that environment when the boundaries are clear and consistent. Okay, what's number 10? So number 10 is last but not least, this one's very important, it's much easier to loosen up a boundary or a limit later than to have a looser boundary and go back and try to firm it up. So this means you can set them much more firmly from the outset, and then as things go on, you can loosen them up. But you can never really go back and have more firm limits uh, because the children will just be pushing on those, and it'll be a power struggle for sure. You talked about that in a previous podcast where the different reasons why it might be tempting to be more lenient up front and how that causes problems later on. Certainly, especially, you know, when we're hoping that we want to nurture them through learning the rules and we want to build those healthy relationships. When it turns out that children learn quicker, when we're consistent and firm with what they can expect from here on out, and it tells them, you know what, I think you can handle it, as opposed to... Um, not setting them clearly, and then suddenly changing the game on them later. Okay, good deal. So you've gone through those 10 fundamentals, and why don't we go ahead and apply that to a scenario? One of the most common situations or topics that we hear about in classrooms or in schools is the dress code and dress code violations. It seems to be a hot-button issue that is always coming up, and it's really challenging for parents and um, teachers and administrators, I'm sure. And it's a just a, an area where boundaries seem to get pushed constantly back and forth. Absolutely. Students love to push on the dress code and the uniform boundary to see what they can get away with, to kind of test out each teacher, you know, where are you at on this? Um, but I think it's a critical area to hold those boundaries and limits and it may seem trivial to some but really it sets the tone for where your boundaries are going to be for a host of different kinds of behaviors in your classroom yeah and it's funny because it always starts small right with a uh, shirt untucked or maybe no belt or maybe a sweatshirt or whatever and then it just it just keeps growing and growing and growing, especially as those boundaries aren't enforced, then it just it just inevitably becomes a bigger and bigger problem, which then makes it even more and more difficult to to pare back and get back to get get back on track. It also um, can create some divide and conquer kind of strategies by students by, well, so and so lets me wear it, or I just came back from this class and I have it on. And it also is very telling to the students about how much respect you have for the dress code, for um, the rules and the handbook, and um, essentially, as I was saying, how united are the teachers and um, administration on holding kids' toes to the fire on this issue. Okay, let's get specific. Let's imagine that during a class, a student is wearing a black sweatshirt that violates the dress code. The student is working quietly on his or her assignment, and you as a teacher didn't notice at first, but now you realize that the sweatshirt is not school approved. What do we do at this point? So let's use that as a scenario for applying some of those 10 fundamentals that, that you went over. And we, we have some questions that I can just read from or, or mention just as thinking questions. Anybody who's listening to this, this was not designed with a single right or wrong answer in mind. The questions and the scenario are really just to get us thinking about what the concept of boundaries is all about and how it might apply because every school and every classroom may be different so just thinking about okay how does this apply to me as a teacher how can I use this to to support healthy boundaries in my classroom okay so the first question is what boundary in this situation has been violated so this one's a little more straightforward the boundary has been the dress code 
um, the rule, the, the um, handbook. So if the dress code is uniforms, then it might be a little bit more concrete about what is accepted and what is not. If there's not uniforms, the dress code gets a little messier. But essentially what we've, the boundary here is what can you wear in the classroom and when are you not allowed in the classroom with that on? So that's the boundary. As a teacher, how are boundaries, or how is the boundary in this situation set with the teacher's actions? So this was that number one, and it's really shifting how we think about boundaries from I need to change someone else's behavior to I need to change my own. So the issue is the child or the student's not wearing the uniform. So we have to really kind of dig deep and think about, okay, well, what action do I need to take to set this boundary in my classroom? Not what does the student need to do? Okay, another question here is, is your boundary defined by your behavior and not the student's? And if so, what action do you take? So when you're thinking about what action to take, you gotta really be thinking about um, what is administration wanting you to do? What are the school-wide policies on um, the uniform violations? Does a child head to the principal? Do they head home? Is the parent called? What happens when um, the boundary is violated? That way, as the teacher, you know what action to take. That's in line with all the other teachers, and everybody's on the same page. So again, so we're not getting that divide and conquer, and students know exactly what to expect. Yeah, and as I'm reading this, and I don't want to get too far ahead with these other questions. I haven't gone through all those, but I'm thinking about my own time as a teacher, and I would want to know where the line is, what the expectations are, and what my options are as a teacher. You know, what the what the what the what the expectations throughout the school are in the case of a dress code violation, so that I'm not having to come up with this or think about responses in the moment either. This should be a, I would prefer that this be an intentional pre-planned, I, I know what I'm doing here before I get to this situation. And this takes us to number four is what's the strategy for enforcing the dress code? And to build on what you just said is, um, students will no doubt give us lots of opportunities to practice our boundary setting when it comes to uniforms. There'll be uh, repeat offenders. We're gonna see it again and again. And so um, this isn't something that should pop up and surprise us. We should really be able to say, oh, I've seen this before and now I know what to do. Um, the principal's got my back, my team has my back. We're all doing the same thing. We're all on the same page. Um, the other thing that I like about knowing exactly what strategies we're using is that then it doesn't really matter if it was an oopsie and an accidental mistake or if this is an intentional boundary pushing or is this some other strategy the kids are using. It really doesn't matter because the response is the same, which then goes to that natural consequence and the child can correct their behavior very quickly. It doesn't become about shame. It doesn't become about um, punishment and we're not we're just letting the consequences do the teaching and next time they remember if it was an oopsie um, or they really see that their their strategy for pushing limits isn't working that's nice because then it's not a confrontation between the 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 teacher and the student it's not a disagreement between the teacher and the student you know there's no favoritism going on here it's not about the personal relationship we're pointing back to, in that situation, you're pointing back to a recognized code or policy or what or rule, whatever you want to call it, and that's what it's about, and that's what everybody can point to and look at and say, is this or is this not being followed? So it's not really about any person or their or picking on anybody or or whether a teacher likes a student or or anything like that. Absolutely. So it's kind of that concept of uh, it's not personal; it's just business. It is what it is. So it doesn't damage those relationships that you've been working so hard to build with each student. Okay, there's some different examples here of strategies for enforcing the dress code. And I don't know if you wanted to get into each of these, but there's public shaming, there's punishment, gentle or private reminder, public announcement, group reminder. I know you included these in here. What were you thinking? Um, this is kind of going back to what you were saying is being armed and ready. So when you do see the sweatshirt, you already know what you're going to do. And more importantly, you know 
why you're doing it. Um, I personally don't recommend public shaming. I don't think it's a healthy way to set boundaries or to build relationships, and I think it can be very damaging. Um, but if that's the strategy that works and you feel good about it, just knowing why you're doing what you're doing is really important. Um, here, we're not really about punishing. We're supposed to be really allowing consequences to do the teaching, letting kids solve their own problems, and you know, maintaining those relationships and those boundaries at the same time. And you can really think about how you might do that. Um, and again, so what are you going to do as a whole? But more importantly, why are we doing that? Kind of what's the philosophy behind it? If we were to justify this kind of consequence, does it make sense? And then also, how can we help it fit different kinds of students? Um, if you publicly shame an introvert who accidentally left their sweatshirt on, that's going to be a really um, damaging interaction and really mortifying. And if that child already has anxiety, that's not going to help. Um, other kids may not have as much of a problem with that sort of public announcement that they're out of uniform, but maybe think about how can we be sort of mindful and be intentional. And um, I suspect once you consistently set this, um, it's really going to become a non-issue because you're in the classroom and you're dressed in what you're supposed to be or you're not. So there really shouldn't be any wiggle room after a while. So as part of what you're talking about here, consequences, identifying what is the consequence for a violation? Because when I think about this, the, the, the example of a police officer pulling somebody over for speeding almost comes to mind, right? You're not allowed to speed, whatever the speed limit is. You've broken the law. If you've broken the law, you get a ticket. It's not about, um, you, you know, if somebody's speeding, they're not um, trying to um, disrespect the police officer, and the police officer doesn't feel disrespected because somebody's stealing. It's not really about the police officer and the speeder. The law is a law. What are the consequences? Are they known by both parties beforehand, and then they, are they enforced? So it's about the law, not the you know, not the relationship or the situations with these two individuals. Yeah, and another example would be your late fee on the credit card. It's not personal. It's automatically uh, put on your account because you were a day late, five minutes late. It doesn't matter. Midnight, 12.05, you're late, $35. And then that consequence helps me remind myself next time to pay on time. So there's not that... There's, there's not excuses, there's not, it's clear, 12 a.m., it's in the, it's been paid or it hasn't. Okay, but it sounds like both the police officer and the credit card company are not defining the consequences of those actions at their whim or in the moment. The police officer doesn't have to come up with a, a, a punishment when he catches a speeder. The law is a law. There's a certain expectation that the law be followed and there is a fine if you don't follow it. So I, I don't mean to go too far off track with this. It just, as you're talking about this, it makes me think, if, if you're a teacher, what is the school's policy for consequences? Is it consistent across? And it may, again, maybe I'm getting ahead, so why don't we go on? No, I think that's great. So what is the consequence, number one? And number two, how are you delivering that? Publicly, privately, whatever it might be. Okay, another question. How can you use positive reinforcement and the power of rapport to ensure students follow the dress code? So first of all, I can tell you that if you have good rapport, you're probably going to have uniform following in your classroom because they're going to respect that boundary. They're going to respect you, um, and they're going to know where the line is. The other part is that positive reinforcement is, okay, we're talking about natural consequences doing the teaching. Well, you know what? Positive consequences also do a lot of teaching, and we had talked about this in a previous as well. So um, throwing in a lot of that positive reinforcement, catching kids getting it right, catching the class, okay, we're all in uniform. I just realized such and such is going to happen, or we get points or whatever, or um, bragging on the students. And so that positive reinforcement is critical to continuing that okay what's the point what's the baseline what's the benchmark okay and we just talked about say speeding tickets as a way of reducing speeding but when you say positive reinforcement you're talking about approaches to increase the behaviors that you do want so you want students following the dress code and so you re you reward that or you you somehow you 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 make that more you incentivize that 
And really, you pay more attention and you have more celebration of, of students who are following the rules than the ones who are breaking them. And this is hard to do because uh, sometimes we're just trying to do behavior management. We don't always um, celebrate and bring more attention to what's going right. But that public praise, that celebration, wow, looking sharp today, you know, those kinds of things can um, just shift the tides big time with this kind of issue. Sounds like if you have clear boundaries and well-defined consequences for breaking them, that actually frees you up emotionally as well to focus more on the positive reinforcement and the rapport. So hopefully you don't even have to get there. I just want to throw in one quick thing there. Um, also, the power of modeling. So if you're thinking about you want kids to show up professional and look professional and feel good about how they're presenting and um, how are we modeling that to the students about the level of professionalism that we're putting off as well. Okay, great. The next question is who owns the dress code problem? or are different aspects of the problem owned by different people? So going back to the scenario, who's who owns this issue? So I think this kind of wraps it all together is we're ensuring that the child owns the problem, we own our own behavior, the consequences are doing the teaching, and everybody's on the same page. So the student violated the dress code, the teacher did not violate the dress code, but it's teacher's job, I'm just reflecting what you're saying, it's a teacher's job to enforce the dress code and that he, he or she does that according to hopefully according to pre-established very clear policies classroom or even better maybe school policies so that there's no surprises everybody kind of knows what's going to happen and it's not about the teacher or the student specifically it's just about consistency and and those consistent clear boundaries and the dress code aside i think this whole concept really helps us support children in thinking and learning and owning their own problems. This is on you. There's natural consequences. I'm here to support. I'm here to hold the boundary. But ultimately, this is your journey. You own the problem. Yeah, I'm going back to other issues in the classroom. And there's all kinds of topics or concerns this could this could relate to grades, late late grading policies, tardy policies, all sorts of stuff. Okay, so we've given 10 fundamentals for setting setting healthy boundaries. Uh, and these are general fundamentals. They apply not just to the classroom or between teachers and students, but really in any interpersonal relationship. And then we went through and talked about a specific scenario, uniforms and dress code violations in the classroom, and laid out a series of questions just to think about, just to get discussions rolling, if you're a teacher listening to this or an administrator just thinking about, okay, how does this apply to my school or my classroom? Are we being consistent? Do I know myself what the expectations are and what the consequences are? Am I controlling my actions rather than trying to control the students? Am I using actions rather than words in order to set those boundaries? Am I refraining from rescuing the child or allowing natural consequences to do the teaching because maybe I'm not upholding healthy boundaries um, and everything else that we went through. So this, this is, I think this is a good scenario to talk about and we may circle back and do another podcast with a different situation. Like I said, I, I remember uh, late work policies was always a big one in the classroom and how they differed from classroom to classroom. So that might be something we do in the future. Is there anything else that you want to add? Nope, that's all on this one. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Okay, that's it for us today. As always, you can find more information and resources at our website, individualmatters.org. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you next time.